Welcome to The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you all with us. Now, COVID-19 is affecting every aspect of our lives, and that's true for the world of sports in spades. The International Olympic Committee finally called off the Tokyo Summer Olympics. The IOC called themselves a beacon to the world, but the beacon was Olympian athletes past and present and Olympic committees who called for this postponement, forcing the IOC to cancel games. What's behind this? Clearly, they worry more about their Olympian profit than the well-being of the athletes and all the people who might attend. And that's just the latest news. Sports are on shutdown everywhere. Stadiums, arenas, coliseums are closed. Professional and college sports are on corona hiatus. What happens to the thousands of men and women who sell you refreshments, who take your tickets, show you your seats, who clean the stadiums and its lavatories, who probably work for minimum wage? What happens to them? Some owners and players are stepping up to make sure they're paid, but many billionaires could care less. So how could this alter the world of sports itself once this is done? Who better to answer those questions than Dave Zirin, who wrote about all this in a series of articles for The Nation magazine and joins us now. Welcome back, Dave. Good to have you with us. Hey, it's great to be here, Mark. And Dave Zirin, of course, is The Nation magazine sports editor, the author of eight books on the politics of sports, his most recent being Brazil's Dance with the Devil, the Olympic Cup, the Olympics, and the Fight for Democracy. He hosts The Nation's Edge of Sports podcast and co-hosts of WPFW's The Collision with Eaton Thomas and still has time to talk to us for a minute. So... So then let's just begin with, um, uh, take a step backwards for a moment before we talk about the Olympics and anything else. I want to focus on an article you did, a conversation with Dr. Adia Benton. Um, and it was really fascinating in terms of how looking at this broader question of sports and, and, corona, and the coronavirus and how different aspects of the sports games have responded to it differently. Talk a bit about what, what that conversation was about. Well, yeah, I talked to uh, Dr. Benton, uh, who's very experienced in these matters, um, about the ways in which the sports world has responded uh, to the coronavirus. And one of the things that uh, we talked about is how uneven it's been throughout the sports world, or at least from the t when the time we did that interview, it was incredibly uneven. You had leagues like the National Basketball Association shut down very quickly, particularly after All-Star Center Rudy Gobert was found to have coronavirus, uh, which led to a lot of awareness among other players getting tested. And then the question of why were they getting tests, even though they were asymptomatic ahead of people in the population who needed them. So that was a whole ball of worms, or sorry, can of worms, ball of wax that we were looking <laughs> ball for. Ball can. Yeah, <laughs> all that good stuff. And as we went through it, there are other sports as well, like that I think reflect a lot about the sports, like the NCAA was very late to cancel March Madness. And one of the reasons why is that they get 89% of their operating revenue from the highly exploitative festival that is uh, bracketology in the NCAA tournament. So there was that aspect of it. Then you have other sports, which we might deem more red state sports like NASCAR and Ultimate Fighting Championship, uh, which were extremely slow to recognize the reality of the coronavirus. And then at long last, you have the Olympics, you know, the, the last scoundrel, if you will, uh, deciding that they were only gonna shut down operations this week and only deciding, as you said, because of an absolute upsurge from athletes and national federations. It, it, you know, this, the, the Olympics themselves, and you can actually maybe add the NCAA into this as well. I mean, this, this really has to do with the domination of sports by money, by big money, by huge profits. I mean, that's what's driving the reluctance to say no, to say we got to stop. I mean, and I think that's something that's not talked about enough. Absolutely. If you don't understand the billions of dollars at stake, you can't understand why these decisions were made as quickly as they were or as slowly as they were. Like for example, when it comes to the National Basketball Association, one could be very cynical and say, because the players are paid so much money, they constitute investments on behalf of the billionaire class of franchise owners. And therefore that they wanted to shut down the league in order to protect their investments. In the NCAA, they obviously invest no salary in the players themselves. It's all pure profit off the top when it comes to the players. And so there, there was a different kind of social weight to keep the trains moving on time. We, we, this, when we talk about the NBA, before I go back to the Olympics for a minute, but this is really interesting to me. You, you had 
you wrote about a whole group of players, uh, Zion Williamson um, and and uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo and others Ante who uh, thank, Ante, thank you who who uh, who put their money up saying we're going to pay the workers in these stadiums and you had people like uh, uh, Cuban of the Mavericks and and Tony Ressler of the of the, of the Atlanta Hawks doing some similar stuff. And this is a real divide there. I mean, we're talking about men and women who work these stadiums, who make very little money, cleaning up our crap in the bathrooms, could be, could be left out to hang to dry. But there are players with class consciousness that are actually stepping up and saying, we're not gonna let that happen. Yeah, and a recent example of this, since I've written that article that got a lot of publicity this week was with the Philadelphia 76ers, where their all-star center, Joel Embiid, said he was going to give $500,000 to pay the workers. And that so uh, humiliated the ownership and embarrassed them that they put out a statement just yesterday that they would pay their workers during the duration of this crisis. And that was something that they were not going to do until Embiid stepped up and put his money down. And I do think that there is this strong connection because I know we view this often as you know, these are millionaire athletes and, uh, you know, they, you know, they, they play a game and all the, the, the tropes that are used against athletes in class consciousness. You have to remember the backgrounds that many of these athletes come from are extremely working class and at times very impoverished backgrounds. So there is this strong connection that these athletes have with the workers at the stadiums the strong connection of what it means to struggle to survive. And that's something that the ownership class just will never understand. So when you take all that, I mean, one of the first questions is, I mean, who are these bloody billionaires who could get, give a crap about the men and women who work in these stadiums? Um, I mean, it, it, it's just, it's almost, it's almost like they are neoliberal, neoconservative, Trump's voice in action when it comes to these people's lives of working class. It's just, I mean, how do you, it's just unconscionable. I'm sorry to be so, it just it enrages me. It, it is enraging. And I think it should be, it's a microcosm because I think it should be enraging to all of us how little the billionaire class has done since this thing has started. I mean, where are they? I mean, all, all the time we're told that we need to have a plutocracy in this country and this incredible gap between rich and poor because of philanthropy. Because if we actually did progressive taxation on the super rich, they would stop giving money to these charities. And yet, I don't see it since coronavirus came forward. I don't see them stepping up to do much of anything. And it's, it's actually, it's, 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 it's embarrassing. It's, it would shame a nation of savages what the, what the billionaire class has done in this country, which is namely nothing. Or trying to lobby Congress to make sure that this uh, bill that's going through is as much of a slush fund for the super rich as possible. It's disgusting. Now, when you talk about um, professional sports owners, they tend to fall into two, one of two categories. They are either legacy owners, so you know this, these their grandparents, grandparents uh, were the people who uh, built their wealth on the backs of, of enslaved people in this country, or on the railroads, or um, and, and then and then this is the money that they have now. It's been generational wealth that's been passed down and only become more concentrated. Or you have people who made huge amounts of money in the tech bubble or in the world of, of Bain Capital style investments, um, hedge fund investments, hedge fund managers who've made out like bandits and then they buy these teams as almost like hobbies uh, for themselves. So you've got old money and new money and there's always a tension between old money and new money uh, when it comes to uh, franchise bosses and how they argue with each other, oftentimes when they bicker. But at the end of the day, they're just hostile brothers. And their solidarity is with them before it's ever going to be with players, let alone stadium workers. So I wonder how you think this, the couple of questions about the future. I mean, how do you think this, this COVID-19 pandemic could change the nature of sports? I mean, we're going to see entire seasons being canceled. Um, it changes the nature of the of capitalist investment in sports and what they get out of it. And, you know, I, I remember back in the day growing up in the 50s as a kid playing ball, you know, all the, the, the players actually lived in your neighborhood because nobody made all that money. They were just play, playing the game. And so, um, so, so, it's, so how do you think this might change the nature of sports itself? That's the great unknown, Mark. I mean, I think if everything changes coming out of this uh, coronavirus pandemic, and I do think a lot is going to change going forward. 
Um, you're either going to see sports become a panacea for the society that's trying to normalize itself. I think that's very possible. Or you're going to see sports become something that's left on the curb, especially in terms of attending live events because of fear of, of, of a regeneration of viruses. And as, if we live in an era of occurring or reoccurring pandemics, live sporting attendance is going to take a tumble. That's going to take a huge bite out of the profits of ownership. That means it's going to take a big bite out of salaries of the players themselves. Because, and then it's going to take a bite out of the salaries of stadium workers because, pardon my French, but you know, when it comes to uh, trickle-down economics, the shit always rolls downhill. Amen. And so what you're going to see is what's, what amounts to a regressive taxation in the world of sports as the athletes and the workers are forced to pay for the crisis that coronavirus could inflict on the world of sports. And what about the Olympics? Let's end with the Olympics, where this might take the Olympics. I mean, they were forced to cancel this out again. We're talking about tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in profit for these companies who support the Olympics. So, so where might that take the Olympics? They're talking about maybe 2021, maybe the Olympics. They have been canceled since World War II. So what about its future? Well, I think there's going to be a real reassessment about these kinds of global mega events, whether you're talking about the World Cup, whether you're talking about the Olympics, and how they can be staged in a way that's uh, healthy for the globe at large, whether you're talking about the environmental impact, which is heavy, of these games, or whether you're talking about just what the games do to host countries, particularly working people in host countries, talking about the debt that a country has to acquire and that is required, uh, the displacement that takes place when people are pushed out of their homes to build stadiums or the athlete's village, uh, the militarization of public space, which always comes with the Olympics, like the, the arming of a security state that doesn't always unwind back to normal days when the Olympics are over, uh, particularly in terms of whether you're talking about uh, in Brazil, for example, drones that were used, uh, facial recognition software, all things that were put in place for the Olympics that never got put back in their box. Uh, so I think there's going to have to be a reassessment of whether those things uh, are, first of all, should exist in the kind of world that we want to live in. And second of all, in an age of global pandemics, do we really want to have these global events where hundreds of thousands of people gather in a given city and then return to their countries? It seems like a way to put uh, diseases on fast forward and viruses on fast forward when we should be talking about uh, containment. You see, in all this, it, to me, it's like the, the contradictions of capitalism as seen through the, the, the pain of this pandemic which also capitalism had some, had some root in the cost of the pandemic, also has to do with capitalist development and exploitation. But, but the fact that this is, really raises the contradictions, I think, in, in ways that people have not seen up close as this. Absolutely. Well, Dave Zirons, always a pleasure to talk with you. I really appreciate your writing and you're taking the time for us here at The Real News and look forward to many more conversations. Thank you so much. And I wanna say how much I really appreciate The Real News Network uh, for everything Real News is doing right now. We need unembedded media so much in this pandemic period. So thank you for the work you're doing, Mark, and thank you to all the engineers and producers that make this possible. Appreciate that, and appreciate you. And I'm Mark Stoney here of the Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Let us know what you think. Give us some ideas, and take care.